I'm delighted to see uh, lots and lots of folks uh, joining us. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Uh, welcome to the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education at Brandeis University. I'm John Levison. I'm director of the Mandel Center. I'm delighted to welcome you to this spotlight session on adult Jewish learning. At the Mandel Center, we're committed to developing and promoting scholarship in Jewish education in order to make a deep and lasting difference on the lives of learners and the vibrancy of the Jewish community. This session and our other events are a way of serving our mission by getting ideas out into the world. And I encourage you to visit the Mandel Center's website for more information about our various events. And the link has just magically gone up. Thank you very much, Liz, for getting that, for sharing that link with folks to the events page at the Mandel Center. This particular session, this spotlight session is a new format for us. Uh, it's, it's an experiment, so we'll see how it goes. Um, it's different than the other kind of session that we've been running recently, which we've called our Learning About Learning series. And in that series, we have zoomed in on, on one particular research project for, for about 30 minutes. But in this series, what we're calling the Spotlight series, we are tackling a topic in Jewish education more broadly, and we're doing it with a group of panelists rather than just one person. And of course, we're giving ourselves a little more time. So we'll have uh, an hour and a quarter today to dive into this topic. We'll wrap up at 2.15 Eastern time. We're using a webinar format. Um, so you uh, all should be able to see um, the panelists um, but not uh, see, see each other. Um, you should be able to submit questions. Um, sorry, wait one second. Um, you should be able to submit questions uh, using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we certainly encourage you to do that. Um, and we are recording this session, uh, but, um, but only the panelists will be recorded, the audience uh, will not be recorded. As you all know, the topic today, our topic is adult Jewish learning. Adult Jewish learning takes place in any number of different settings and formats with any number of different audiences. For some people, when you say adult Jewish learning, they might think of a class given by the rabbi at a local synagogue, Others will immediately think about cohort-based programs with extended curricula over time, like the Melton School of Adult Jewish Learning or the Wexner Heritage Program or here in Boston, the Maya Program. And both of those are important paradigms for where and how adult Jewish learning takes place. But adult Jewish learning also takes place in other settings and, and, and other spaces, sometimes in local communities, sometimes in the context of service opportunities. And of course, these days, all kinds of learning takes place online as well. And we'll hear more about all those kinds of learning opportunities. And then there's still other paradigms. Adult Jewish learning happens in conversion courses and courses for interfaith couples. It happens around Shabbat tables. It happens in Jewish cultural spaces. In fact, once we expand our vision and expand our conceptions a bit, we start to realize how broad, how diverse, and how vibrant this field of adult Jewish learning actually is, and how exciting it is. But for those of us in the field of scholarship of Jewish education, we also know how little current scholarship there has been. We just don't have that many studies of particular programs or settings, or of the students who participate in them, or of the instructors in them. Now, there was a flurry of scholarship about 15 years ago or so, um, but since then, the field just hasn't gotten a lot of attention from scholars. And that's why we've been so excited about a project at the Mandel Center that's focused on adult Jewish learning. It's called the Portraits of Adult Jewish Learning Project. And why we're so excited about today's session as well. We've brought together not just a terrific group of educators, although they are a terrific group of educators, but more specifically, our panelists are a group of people who have undertaken a set of studies of specific learning opportunities for adults. 
they've actually taken the time to zoom in, to gather relevant data, and really try to understand what's happening in each of their chosen locations. So let me briefly now introduce our panelists. I'm not going to say a lot about them, but you can certainly um, find out more about them online. If we have if we have links, we'll put them up um, to individual uh, places. Uh, going in alphabetical order, uh, Sarah Alpert works at Avoda, where she is the director of the Avoda Institute for Social Change, and she studied Avoda as a location of a certain kind of adult Jewish learning. Rabbi Yaffa, sorry, Rabbi Yaffa Epstein is the director of the Wexner Heritage Program, and that's the program that she has been studying. Dr. Jane Shapiro is the founder of Orot, Center for New Jewish Learning, and she's been studying aspects of adult Jewish learning among a group of long-term learners, so folks who have been studying together for, for quite some time. And finally, Dr. Diane Tickton Schuster is an affiliated scholar at the Mandel Center. Um, and she's actually published several books on adult Jewish learning uh, earlier in her career. And she's been the leader of the project here at the Mandel Center uh, over the last couple of years, the project that we called Portraits of Adult Jewish Learning. And her own current research has focused on an online adult Jewish learning opportunity with, with, opportunity with Rachel Korazim and We'll hear more about that in a few moments. So we've got a diverse group of educators who've studied a diverse group of settings and frameworks, and we're looking forward to hearing more about that. I'm going to be asking them some questions, engaging them in conversation, but of course we also want to hear your questions, so please do take advantage of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I want to encourage you, uh, as you're listening, to think about how to frame your question in general terms, if possible, um, rather than only to one specific panelist. I think that will that will help um, our conversation, will help move our conversation along. So now let me begin with um, my questions for um, for each of our panelists. I want to start. Um, we'll just go in the same order that I just introduced you. Um, I want to start by. Um, by asking you to tell us about the particular learning opportunity that you study. Each of you, as I said, each of you has taken the time to look closely at a particular adult Jewish learning opportunity. Um, and now we want to just hear a little bit about what those specific opportunities were, what those settings were. So Sarah, tell us about what you studied. Hey, thanks so much, very happy to be here. Um, so at Avoda, we run a number of programs dedicated to fostering more social justice engagement in the Jewish community. For this project, we studied our oldest and really flagship program, our Service Corps. Um, it's been around since 1998. I participated in it in 2002, and we are now quite a year, number of years beyond that. And we studied one particular cohort. We picked kind of one city, one household, one year, and went into depth on their experience, and in particular with three participants. Um, in the Service Corps, our participants volunteer close to full-time, in various agencies in their cities. They live together in intentional community and they participate in Jewish learning um, on evenings and in some daytime programs throughout the year. Wonderful, wonderful. And we'll, we'll look forward to hearing more about those three focal participants that you kind of zoomed in on um, to, uh, to understand more about what you found there. Um, Yaffa, tell us about your setting. Sure, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with you all. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I just wanna mention uh, my colleague, Dr. Tali Zelkowitz, who is with us um, and she's not on this panel, but she deserves a lot of uh, credit, most of the credit for her work. We studied it together and co-created the curriculum and studied uh, what we learned. So um, we study the Wexner Heritage Program, um, which is a program that's been around for 40 years at, at the Wexner Foundation. Um, and it um, is geared towards volunteer leaders in the Jewish community between the ages of 30 and 50. Uh, we had three cohorts of 20 members um, who we um, created and taught a pluralism curriculum to. Uh, the Wexner Foundation has at its core principle uh, and value of uh, pluralism and diversity. And so our cohorts are fundamentally diverse and we wanted to study what happens when we explicitly 
um, look at diversity and pluralism and teach pluralism as a skill. Wonderful, wonderful. Jane, tell us about your setting. It's also a pleasure to be here. I want to say that it's because of another Mandel program that I participated in, the Teacher Educator Institute, that I made a segue from being a reflective practitioner to a researcher. And it was at that moment when I made that move, being curious about my teaching, that I realized for research that I really wanted to take the laboratory of two groups of students who I have been studying with on a weekly basis now for about 16 years each, that I wanted to do a deep investigation of their learning experiences and how they, as long-term learners, learners would articulate what learning looked like for them from their perspective. So. Great. And, and uh, Diane, tell us about what you studied. Well, as all of you know, um, this opportunity to be in this conversation about adult Jewish learning is something that I've been promoting for 25 years, and I'm thrilled that we are together um, having this conversation. Um, as a learner, a couple of years, a year and a half ago, I heard from a friend about the work of Rahel Korazim, a master exemplary uh, Jewish educator and Israel educator. Uh, she was doing um, a lecture for the Hartman Institute, and I tuned in, and I watched the a wonderful style, the pedagogy of a master educator. And I followed up calling Rachel and saying, could I learn more about why you teach, what you teach and how you teach? And that led to my being a participant observer in a five session book group online on Zoom, uh, studying the work of Emuna Elan, an Israeli writer. And I had ended up not only studying the learners who were around the table, but really focusing on the pedagogy of Rachel. Great. So um, I, I, I want to um, circle back, and maybe Diane will just since uh, you just had the floor, let's let's stick with you. Um, so what did what did you learn? What did what what's a key takeaway from um, from doing this study uh, in your case about about this uh, class with Rachel Karazin? Well, I think the uh, framing principle here is that Rachel has a mission to help diaspora Jews engage the complex complexities of Israel. She um, tremendous, totally understands and gets it about diaspora Jews' learning needs, uh, our, our, sometimes our understandings of Israel or our, our uh, prejudices and our misconceptions, and she engages us as learners to really get into what she calls the intimate discourse with Israel. And um, it, it's her style of bringing us to that discourse and showing us that we have to listen to the other. We can't stay within our own frames. We need to think beyond those frames. And I think that from an adult learning point of view, the participants in this program are well-educated Israel lovers, people who have participated in all kinds of adult learning experiences, but it's Rachel's ability to also to use literature, poetry and literature to get us into the cultural conversation, the political conversation, the historical conversation uh, that I, I found compelling to watch how she did it, but also compelling to hear how meaningful that was to the learners. Yeah, and, and in the paper, you're actually able to show us, right, to, you know, with, the, with the data to show us a little bit of how, um, of how she does that. Um, Jane, tell us um, for you what was uh, what was a key takeaway from uh, the study of these longtime learners. So, in many ways, some of the things that I'm curious about and have been studying are similar to what Diane found when she did her research. But um, I am interested in how the learners talk about a learning experience, what it is. How do they identify when they've learned something? What is going on? What factors in an environment are making that happen for them? And then over time, um, what motivates them to keep doing this? Um, and then also how they see themselves changed as a result of that learning. So my focus became even more um, over time, the research became much more about developmental teaching and developmental learning, um, how adult learners changed. Um, as a result of what they were experiencing in class and also what they understood that I was doing as a teacher. So it was a convergence of 
teaching and pedagogy and experience and development kind of coming together. So when you say when you say developmental, I mean usually when we think about developmental, we think about kids, right? right. Developmental stages. Or, so, but what what do you mean in this context with so with, uh, yeah. these adults? So I, I think that there are many, many adult educators who are wonderful, who teach for the experience, for the information, because they have an outcome and they want to see an adult do something, um, or there's a professional skill they want to learn. But in adopting a developmental pedagogic practice, it really turned my eye thinking much more specifically about over many years. And this was the value, of course, of having people for 16 years. We've grown old together, um, as I was able to really am continuing to watch a very nuanced but um, definite trajectory of how people came into class because maybe they wanted some information, or they maybe they wanted to learn some skills, um, or they wanted to just be able to talk more about Jewish things. But through a very, a step of first acquiring skills about decoding texts, talking about texts, being in dialogue, whether it's chavruta or conversation or discussion cells, whatever that was to be able to listen to a multivocal way of looking at the text and being able to talk about that, that they developed an enormous sense of interpersonal awareness of each other um, at the same time that they were making personal meaning. Yeah. And then all of those things became uh, motivating to them and ultimately a form of spiritual development. And so there is a clear cut arc in this kind of teaching that I would say that you can watch adults develop over time in very specific ways by applying some certain pedagogic practices, if that's your goal. So, so there, there are two things that I, I think are particularly fascinating about what you shared, Jane. One is, um, I think we often imagine for good reason that that people come to adult uh, adult learning um, opportunities, as you said, sometimes because they're wanting to learn something specific, they have a, a specific need, but they also come for the social, they come for the interactive, they come for the communal, they come because they wanna be with people for, um, and of course that's true. And of course, you know, I'm sure you can tell us a lot about all of those elements of the experience, but what you're saying is, but that's not all, that there actually there was this, you use the word trajectory. The other thing that's fascinating about that trajectory is, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you could have identified at the outset, you know, of the 16 years um, that you would have said, like, here's what we're going to be working on for 16 years. It wasn't that kind of planful curriculum. We're going to, you know, we're going to spend a year and, you know, 18 months working on this skill and then maybe a three years working on that. That's not the way it worked. You're you're now reflecting back on a, a, a trajectory that they undertook, but without the kind of intentional or or curricularized structure that we typically think about when we think about learning trajectories. I'm I'm very happy that you give me a chance to give a shout out to my Chicago colleague John Dewey. <laughs> but um, I, very much, we tend to think of constructivist curriculum and constructors teaching as being about children. And I found that to be the case with my learners that um, whatever we thought we first started when they said like, we just want to study the whole Torah now and not cut and paste texts in a notebook. Can we just read the whole text? That came from them that, and I said like, okay, we can do that. But I want you to understand they're gonna be texts that are challenging or kind of boring or this or that. And I said, okay, we're, we're there. Whatever it was, starting from that place in them and then moving with them. And as, and then this array of things that they needed as learners became obvious to me um, that, you know, how to talk, structuring how you talk about a text, the use of Hebrew, which these are many people, they've learned to use Hebrew, even if they're not Hebrew fluent, the use of Hebrew, challenging the text, asking questions, digesting questions, seeing patterns, like all these kind of skills that led when I interviewed them into being very well of a, that as they were making meaning, they were also thinking differently about the people in the group with them. Mm -hmm. And so they were also constructing what this meant to them in a, in a larger way than just getting through the text. And so there's always been this, I think, beautiful dance 
between where they are, where we're holding today and where we're going and the journey that we're on together, that we use a lot of the language of we're on a lifelong journey together. And so the, the movement back and forth has been, you're hundred percent correct, not an agenda that I set up from the very beginning, but I'm certainly so grateful to be able to be on with them. So. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. For turning to you, um, when, uh, when you did this, uh, when you looked at this work around diversity and pluralism, what's the, what's the key takeaway from the project? Yeah, thank you. So it's interesting to, to think about this developmentally, because I think that we also were in a similar framework. I don't know if we articulated in that way, but I think hearing that it really resonates very deeply. Um, we, um, you know, when we conceived of the pluralism curriculum for the Wexner Foundation, what's important sort of to note is that, of course, um, pluralism had been implicit for the, for the foundation's work in many, in many realms, and really every cohort has diversity and pluralism in mind when we're choosing the participants and the faculty. But what we came to understand was that we needed to actually teach pluralism as a skill, make it explicit, uh, particularly in the world that we're living in today, which is so polarized, people, even if they had the best of intentions, didn't know how to, <laughs> how to actually live pluralism. And what often happens, I think we, we see this a lot in pluralistic spaces, is that there's a tendency to damp down difference. And what we really wanted to do was actually bring out the difference and then think about how do these differences are real and they exist. How do we live um, with that. But what we came to learn was we sort of identified in, in all three cohorts across the board, sort of these four educational hurdles, we called them. Um, one is, you know, can, what happened? Can I sit with you who are different to me? Can I even sit with you? What does that do to me when I sit with someone who thinks differently than me? Two, my own insecurity in being able to sit with you. Can, who am I to be sitting here? Do I know enough? Am I Jewish enough? Am I knowledgeable enough? You know, the third one was sort of, okay, now that we're sitting together, what do we do? How do we do this thing called pluralism? What mechanism methodology? And then a very important question that sort of <laughs> was, okay, well, if we're already sitting at the table, aren't we already preaching to the choir because we're willing to be sitting here? So I think those were sort of our four real takeaways in terms of, you know, what does it mean to help adults really surface difference and build community and lead communities um, through that difference? Yeah, and you can, you can start to imagine, you know, every setting will be different, but you can start to imagine it's at least a plausible hypo hypothesis that these four dynamics that you've identified will show up right, in other places, yes. um, and that we can start, we can already start to anticipate. So this is how research, this is how scholarship can actually feed practice. Because if you know, if you're thinking, I'm designing a curriculum, I'm creating a setting, whatever it happens to be, um, and how, how can I anticipate surfacing these issues or dealing with these issues or being prepared for the questions around my personal integrity or my personal security, those kinds of things. Great. And, um, and Sarah, turning back to you, tell us about the a key takeaway from the study of Avodah. Sure. So, you know, our um, service core members are all generally, our, our official age range is 21 to 26. Most people are more narrow than that. It's really about 22 to 24, um, with a few exceptions outside of that. And we sometimes call them emerging adults. Yes, exactly. And so, and that idea of what that emerging stage looks like became such an important part of the research. And my co-writer um, and co kind of researcher, Dr. Abby Ehrman, brought in a number of just really crucial outside texts to help us understand at Avodah sort of what, what is the larger body of research that can help us even better understand our participants and where they're coming from. And I think one of the key takeaways from all of it that really was from both that outside research and from our work with the, with our particular portrait was that we really can't um, kind of overestimate the impact of previous experiences or kind of baggage that people are walking into a space with, especially at that age. That there is so much kind of tenderness and, and, and kind of fragility around, and I think in a, in a really understandable and in some ways healthy way around saying, I, I know I have a good sense at that age of kind of what has failed me, what spaces have really helped me 
kind of grow and succeed. And I haven't had a chance yet to necessarily learn how to create and inhabit that as an adult. And so we kind of get them at this really rich moment as they're coming in with a lot of um, that some, some kind of like, there might be some sort of over what might seem like an overreaction to some sort of expectation from someone else in the house or something else in the program, but really is linked to, again, this question of sort of what are they coming out of? What have they experienced um, in environments that have mostly really been dictated for them, where they've sort of had to fit themselves into other structures in the past? And how can we, and then really how can we help them develop as much agency as possible over being able to say, this is the kind of Jewish life I want to lead. This is the kind of Jewish person I think I am. This is the stuff I want to explore. And how do we really help them? We want them not to leave the program. They don't need to know the answers to all of that, but we want them, we call it, we use a phrase empowered access. We want them to feel like their literacy, they know where to go with it. They know kind of how to access the kinds of Jewish learning and Jewish life that will inform them as they go forward. Yeah. And, it, you know, when we think about emerging adults, we think so much about, um, about fluidity and, and, and change and trying on new things. And it's so helpful to remember that all, that's true. I mean, there is this tremendous fluidity and they're all bringing stuff uh, with them um, from, from prior Jewish experiences, from family, from schools, from um, really, that's, that's, that's terrific. Um, I wanna ask a question. I'm gonna open this up um, just generally for anybody who wants to respond about, um, about the diversity of adult Jewish learners. We hear a lot about that. We refer to it ourselves a, a little bit. Um, I, I don't know how we would measure like our adult Jewish learners more diverse than, than, uh, than kids, but certainly it feels like it's a very salient feature of adult Jewish learning oper opportunities. So um, I'm wondering what kinds of diversity do you, did you, see in, in, in your particular settings? I want to say that um, the, around the screen for in Rachel's group, there was both the diversity of people coming from different parts of the world. That was the, the benefit of Zoom. So, and there was a, an age diversity. However, there was a lot of homogeneity. It was primarily women. Uh, the ages ranged from 50, the early 50s to the late, to the uh, low 80s. So there was that age diversity, but there was more of a shared sense of a commonality among who we were. These were all book lovers, readers, lovers of Israel one way or another. But I, I think that the within that were different um, feelings, different political uh, sensibilities about Israel, different levels of confidence. I think that there were people who um, were not very sure where they where they're views were and, and needed a lot of direction to how do I organize the information. Other thoughts? I, I'm, I'm actually curious, you can choose to respond or not. Um, I'm guessing that, well, Jane, your group was all women? Uh, there have been men who have rotated in and out, but the, the consistent group is all women, so. Okay, yeah. and I'm guessing also at Avodah, it's pre predominantly women? Predominantly women, um, although I would say within that, um, Avoda has always had very high queer representation. And so that also impacts both the range of genders in our program and also the range of other kind of aspects of gender experience. Yep. Yeah. So, there so are it's just a fascinating. Yeah. There, 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 men also participate in Rahel's program. I'm not suggesting that it's yeah. exclusively women, but it's predominantly women. It, yeah. It's just something in, in, when we think about diversity, it's interesting to think about um, gender and sexuality and thinking about sort of who shows up for what kinds of um, learning opportunities, um, it, including learning opportunities that are embedded in other structures like, like in Avoda um, yeah. or, or Wexner. I wanna, I wanna build on this because I think it's easy to say, well, that, you know, it's a group of women in the room, so that's not very diverse. So, but I'm, I'm thinking now, because I wanna think back, like what did I learn from my students and their experience is that because the, with the way that we would study the text of the Torah is with Mikra Gedolot, the different voices around the page. One of the place where I see diversity is I have certain students who 
they love the mystical approach. So I go, okay, you Ramban, you know, here or somebody else who they want to think about what does this mean to me in my life today? Or somebody else who's like, well, what's the historical take on this? Or you have people like they want to know the source criticism piece, or other people like, what does this mean to me as a communal leader? That the diversity is in the entry point. Um, and you know what Sarah called baggage. I said different people have different entry points where the text is going to speak to them, and having an awareness of them that multivocal entry points. I think as a pedagogically means okay, uh, this text is going to this comment on this text is going to speak to your your unique point of view, and then it's fun to watch over time how those get messed up. But um, I see a lot of diversity in in that um, way. As I look around you, the and So let me ask you about that. Do you, do you, as you think about that experience, um, being the instructor in that setting, did you find that there were people who, that, that different people are playing kind of different interpretive games, like a <laughs> parallel play, or is there interaction between these? Well, they're, not, they're not games. There are certain people for whom um, the attachment First of all, sometimes it depends on their educational background. I have a physician in my class and she's super interested in anything that seems medical or scientific, but <laughs> she's become a student of Musar and so she and she loves Kabbalah. So it's more the kinds of um, the way we think about the, the, the original definition of the word discipline. People have certain content areas or approaches, or we use lenses or hats. I mean, those certain things bring in is like the way they approach it. For me as a teacher, I have to be aware of like all of those different things all the time. And like, if we come to something and say, oh, this might be something that will speak to you as a community leader. Um, but, um, and it also makes me have to be on my toes to think of like, when is an appropriate time to introduce some source criticism for people who really need that analytical way of looking at the text or, mm -hmm. and for all of them addressing their religious needs around the text is that um, there's some standing on your, you know, one foot and looking around and thinking about that. So. Right, right. But as I'm, as I'm hearing, Jane, it's, it's, um... So in any classroom, in any, in any educational setting, we're thinking about the, the individual students and we're thinking about the collective, right? We're engaged in a shared project, not just a series of individual projects or individual inquiries. Um, so, and I imagine certainly in, in your case where you're talking about um, years of shared experience that there's, um, you know, the, the physician doesn't, doesn't stay in her place. She's shaped through the experience of interacting with others. And all of a sudden she's not all of a sudden, it's not all of a sudden over time, she becomes a different person with different questions and different sensitivity to different aspects of the text or her life or other lives of others or, or, or learning process. Um, Yafa, what, um, what are your thoughts about this question of the kinds of diversity in the, in the community? Yeah, so, so it's interesting. I was going to say, like, sort of from the opposite perspective of what Jane said, where it's like, it looks like everyone is similar and actually everyone's very different. And at Wexner, you know, we build cohorts consciously from the beginning to be different. And, and that, that's a, that is a challenge in and of itself, because this is, a, and this is, again, what was pointed out by one of the members was like, you know, well, if we're sitting around this table already, we obviously already believe in the project of diversity or of pluralism. But actually, you know, um, and here we were informed by um, Diane Eck from Harvard, you know, that, that pluralism is very different than diversity. I can build a diverse uh, group that might not be a pluralistic group because you have to actively engage in pluralism. You have to uh, seek out the differences and then think about how we're gonna live um, together through them. So, so I think that that's an interesting sort of flip side of diversity is we can have lots of diverse spaces, but if we don't push ourselves and push our students to encounter the difference of that diversity, we're really just doing tolerance and we're really just sort of sitting next to each other in a classroom without fully engaging um, in, in the value of that um, multivocal right. you know, perspective that we have. Right, and I sort of imagine a, um, a continuum where, um, you know, anytime you've got more than one person in a classroom, you've got multiple ideas, you've got multiple perspectives, and you're hoping, if, if, if you're the educator, you're hoping that these folks will learn from each other, that they'll, 
they'll encounter new ideas, right? They'll, they'll get it a little bit outside their own, their own bubbles. Um, but the continuum is how explicit we want to make that, how much we want to name that as, um, as really the, the, one of the desired outcomes. So, and I think um, that we're, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, John, just, can I just move on? Please. And I think, I think that we're actually afraid to do that today because I think that we were, we're scared that if we, you know, do that work and create those explosions, let's say, they won't, we won't be able to contain them. So adults, I think this is where adult education is different. Adults sort of are like, oh God, I don't know if I can contain that. Or I don't know if the teacher mm-hmm. will be able to contain that. So I won't say what I really think. You know, that sort of self-censoring that happens in diverse spaces specifically um, I think it is is a is that is a risk that we learned about. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, you know, when we talk about adult Jewish learning, I I worry sometimes that what we're missing actually is the learning piece. Um, and 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 maybe that's because you know when we think about K twelve education, we typically we have some kind of assessments, the good assessments, the bad assessments. But in some way, those assessments help us to make learning. Um, visible, hopefully they do. Um, and maybe it's because we don't we don't necessarily have the right conceptual frameworks for the kinds of learning um, that are ha- happening in, among adults and maybe we're not sure if we're, if we're looking for the right thing. And sometimes, sometimes in adult Jewish learning, um, the, the learning is downplayed and what we really have is performance. So it's not that learning doesn't happen, it just becomes a little bit hidden because of the performative aspect of the, of the instructor. Um, so what's your perspective on this? What are your portraits, your studies, um, what do they show you about adult Jewish learning as a kind of growth experience or kind of development? Jane, you already touched on this a little bit in terms of the trajectory. Yeah, you can see me nodding as often to say, I, I think that there's a, you have to watch for when learning takes place, but I think having, having some ideas about um, what it looks like when it's beyond just personal meaning making, because it's very nice and adults love to emote and make it personal and, oh, my life has been changed by this, very nice, but like, show me what you learned in my class. And I learned this once from being in a class when I asked a group of students, they've been studying history with me, like, what did you learn in the class? And they all said, oh, we had such a good time being with you. And I realized nobody said anything about any history they'd learned for a whole year. And I was devastated. So I watch for things now. And so things like when somebody, remember this text speaks to this text, when they make associations between one place and another place, or when they can take two things and synthesize or when they can take two things that have that look disparate and they can come up with a solution to the problem. And anytime they're being referential across the text to me is a sign that they remember something that they've read long ago. I, th- I think also, and, and then I'll, I would love to everybody else has to say like the use of Hebrew language when they can say, oh, this word makom, that's an interesting word. I bet it means this and this and this. I know that in the process of being in class that they've acquired lots of um, learn, uh, whether it's information or learning or understanding about how Jewish wisdom has been constructed over the years um, and how this system works, that, that they own that there and that, that that's a tool that they have. So the, yeah. and those are those that's learning. That's not I mean, having fun with me. Yeah. Yeah, it's right. It's not. It's also fun to be to spend time with you. But in addition, yeah. When when you can see the way that language changes, language use changes, whether that's new terminology or more sophisticated language or the way that people ask questions, that's that's actually one of the ways that I think about. You know, if if we if we were to take a population without just asking a bunch of multiple choice questions, which nobody wants to do. Um, how would we track um, the kinds of, of development? And I, I think a language would be a, a key yeah. one. Yeah. Other thoughts? I'd like to comment on uh, something I observed when interviewing Rahel Korzim's learners, and I'd ask them what they learned and how did their views change. They weren't that reflective on what they had learned. What they mostly wanted to talk about was Rahel as a teacher and how they had learned wonderful uses of Zoom and they, many of them themselves were teachers, often teaching their own grandchildren by, via Zoom. And they said, and I love how she put circles around things. I loved her PowerPoints. I loved her, her structure of the classes, the photos that she used. So the learning is not only the content that we imagine. Another thing is Rahel also was learning 
And this is one of the things that we all, and Jane, in Jane's work, her own learning about teaching. And uh, in the, Rahel was running two book groups at the same time, but one started earlier. And she came to the second book group and said, you know, the first book group made a point I hadn't thought about before. And consequently, here's where I want us to go. So we not only had the benefit of her reflection um, in terms of product, but we saw her in process. And that transparency, that um, authenticity on her part is was extremely um, compelling to the learners and feeds into all kinds of understanding about high quality adult teaching, which is uh, adults want to know that the teacher is both an expert, but also an authentic person. And right. we saw that a lot. Right. So there's a kind of modeling that happened. Absolutely. And, and particularly when I think about, you know, those who may have been educators themselves or, or Zoom users anyway, um, the, the thought that comes to mind as I'm listening, Dan, is, is that it's a kind of apprenticeship, right, where you're, you're sitting with somebody who's good at something and and maybe learning about how they do some aspect of their work. Often in education, we'll talk about cognitive apprenticeship. This doesn't feel like it's purely cognitive. It feels also behavioral. There's like, there's some things that she's doing that that we find are really interesting or, or helpful. Um, but that's also part of what you're suggesting. That's also part of the learning that's happening. I would say also there's an element of coaching about learning how to learn. And, and she taught us to read closely. Uh -huh. She taught us to, to not trust only what we were seeing on the page. That kind of coaching for literacy was a, a different kind of coaching that I really saw in operation. Interesting. Other thoughts? I'd love to bounce off of what Diane was saying about being able to be surprised by what they learn. That's been a big lesson for us at our own learning internally for staff at Avoda over the years is that we can't always predict which pieces are going to stick. And because we've really, we're really trying to recruit a pretty like diverse range of participants and not trying to necessarily force them in any one direction, but especially in terms of their Jewish life, then if we're really going to model that, we have to kind of offer a lot of pathways in and let ourselves be like kind of surprised and learn with them on which things are really going to stick. I remember my first year as a program director, in some of my core members' reflections at the end of the year, they were quoting me on things that I never would have expected. Things where I'm like, that's what you remember? But it was useful. I was like, oh, that actually was a useful tool for you. We talked about the way to handle this interpersonal moment with another, with a housemate. And, you know, and sort of, and it was really helpful to kind of see, oh, there won't, it won't always be the thing that I think was sort of the core of the lesson. Although also we don't want to lose those things too. But how do we make sure the learning environment is so rich and so full of opportunities for kind of revelation, opportunities for learning, um, that we know they're going to walk out with. And we try to make sure we have these broader kind of frameworks of, are you walking out with new spiritual tools? Are you walking out with that sense of empowered access for, in terms of your Jewish literacy? Do you have a sense of a theory of change around how social, how social injustice occurs and what people can do to move through it? But within, we try to keep those frameworks, I would think like as kind of well-defined, but intentionally broad as possible knowing that it is going to be most effective for us if they each can kind of find their own, their own kind of pathway into what is most useful for them there. Um, one thing I remember from my own Avoda experience, like the conversation on the subway home from programming was often as important a part of what I took from a program as the program itself. And we have no idea, like we might hear what happens in that conversation if they report it back at the next program, we might not. And we really saw that reflected in our interviews and in the work we did with our surveys was people talking about really the learning environment for them was every moment of that year. It wasn't just the times they were in workshops and sessions with us. It was home, it was work, it was conversations between, it was all of that. Right, right, which makes sense based on everything we know about kind of the social nature uh, of learning and also is such a reminder of how for all the wonderful aspects of Zoom, it's limited, right? Like if you, if you don't, if you're not walking home with that, somebody afterwards, um, you may well be missing. There, there are a number of, um, of wonderful, wonderful questions. I'm sure we're not gonna get to, to all of them, um, but one of our colleagues asks about um, the particular phenomenon of, of adult Jewish learners who, you know, when we think about the American Jewish community, we think about very high rates of secular education um, and, those folks 
often bring this discrepancy between their high rates of secular education and some insecurity about their about their Jewish learning, about their Jewish background. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering whether you have seen that play out and, and whether there are kind of approaches that you have seen that, that are really effective given that phenomenon. Yafa, it sounds like you wanna. I really do because this was a huge learning for us. And we, we, had, a, we had a sense that this was the case. I think we've certainly, um, <clears throat> we certainly, I think it's a huge piece of adult Jewish education is this sense that um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very skilled and very educated in my, in my professional life, in my home life, in my, you know, my work life. I, but when it comes to Judaism, I, I feel very insecure. And I think particularly when it comes to pluralism, there's a sense that that actually causes a self-silencing again. And, um, and so we built the curriculum when we, when we created this curriculum for pluralism, we built in an entire um, unit that was about how do we help our learners feel like they are empowered. And, and what, what's important, and this is something that I, I, that my colleague, Dr. Talia Zelkowitz and I, you know, have talked a lot about what's important to us is not saying that there's a specifically correct way to be Jewish or a specific canon of Jewish knowledge necessarily. Although I will say that the Western Heritage Program has a very clear curriculum of what we think Jewish leaders need to know. But the, the purpose of this unit was about how do I identify that I am making Jewish choices? Mm. Whether I um, whether they're the same choices as other people, whether they are by definition, I am, I am making choices every day in my Jewish life. And we actually had our members list those and write the narrative of what that means to them and then share that among their group. And that was sort of, it was, I think it was very important to one, help people understand that it's not just um, the diavad, you know, after the fact, I, I'm this kind of Jew, but actually every single day I'm making choices and those are Jewish choices. And that shift and then sharing that with others who made different choices was very powerful. And it helped to build a level of empowerment and security. Not again, not that they had to learn a specific thing and now I feel good about myself, but that I had to identify that I'm an adult and I'm making choices as a Jew and what those look like. That was a very, really, really important part of our curriculum. So I have a thought. I and I, it is emerging from this conversation. So I love that this is an emergent answer. I use humor in my class a lot. And I just realized as Jeff was talking that I will often use humor as a balance to the um, this question, to the seriousness with which I take, uh, uh, taking seriously that the Torah is, that there's what to know and there's what to learn at a certain point. You have to just get it, go at it and not feel sorry. And I can't do this and I can't do that. So I'll do things like, um, how many of you took English in high school? They'll go, okay, you can read the text, get to it. Stop <laughs> telling me what you didn't get. Or, you know, what if you were ambivalent about your childhood education experience, okay, big deal. You had other educational experiences, deploy them. Or I will often say like, you know, what fantasy they have about some great scholarly family in which I grew up were, and I go like, snap out of it. I went to afternoon Hebrew school. My parents were not like, snap out of it. One day at a time, you too can acquire this stuff. Just get at it already. And so in some ways, it sort of like, I, there's, I use the humor as a little bit of impatience. Like, okay, you've got five other degrees and you didn't like this get at it already because it's valuable. And that's where sort of what the, the deep importance of this learning is something that I don't joke about at all. Um, it's like, it's like, okay, but everybody had to start somewhere to start, so. Thanks. Yeah, I just like to say that I saw Rachel do this around Hebrew as well. She would mm. say, that's another reason that you should learn Hebrew. That's another, <laughs> nice one, you know, go, go ahead. But I, I think that that the building on people's skills and strengths and what they bring to the situation becomes um, a, a reinforcement away from that sense of insecurity. Just as Jane said, you, you know how to do this, do it. And I, th I think that stretching learners, that adult, what I saw in this class and in all of my work is that adults may say on the one hand, oh, I can't get there, but they're very self-directed, they're very motivated, they want to become competent. If you give them the skills, and that's what I saw going on uh, between the roadmaps, the PowerPoints, the resources, the source sheets, Rachel was giving people 
and some one person says she's spoon feeding us, but in fact, she was giving people tools that then mm -hmm. they could go and use themselves. Yeah, interesting. So one of our colleagues um, is is asking us to to reflect on um, not just what the individual students kind of learn in the particular setting, but then what the this is my my paraphrase what the what the spillover is or what the what the effects are. Right. Do they take this learning to their families? Do they take it to their communities? Do they, does it change things in the Jewish world or in the world in, in general? Um, because, you know, we're, we're all educators. We're thinking about, about learning. We're thinking about the, uh, about the individuals. But we also, presumably, we also have broader goals for, for the Jewish world, for the world in general. So, um, so I'm curious what you saw in these programs um, around that, what I'm calling spillover or transfer is another technical term we might use. Learning transfer, learning transfer. Yeah. Sarah, yeah. that's your question, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's a really big, that's a, that's a huge question within Avodah's theory of change and, and a, an assumption that we have seen bear out over now 20 plus years of core members. Um, our mission is to impact the wider Jewish community. So our kind of question has been, can we do that by putting these incredibly thoughtful, like young people into both make sure that they stay in Jewish life and in justice work. Cause often people will like at, at that age when they're sort of feeling so many of these kind of feelings of, but I care about this and how does that align with this? And there's often a chance that people will pull away from one or the other or both or burn out in one or the other or both. Um, and so our question has been, can we keep them in those over time? And how does that affect the people around them? And what we see is that like, yes, they do stay in. Over 80% of our participants um, have stayed in, in social justice work over now the years that they've been out of the program. Um, and I think it's at a higher percentage of people who hold some sort of, who were Jewish, Jewish kind of practice and learning remains a big part of their life. Um, and we do hear from people all the time about how those, how the learning that, the kind of learning that one person does in the program when they get passionate about a particular way of engaging with Jewish justice, then of course they're going to bring their friends along with them. And that's idea, that's what we want, that's what we want to see. And we make sure that in, a, in the later part of the program, we start to do a lot of skill building around how will you talk about this with other people? How will you bring people with you? Because one of the sessions we do is called Who Speaks For Me? We say like, people are speaking for you as Jews out in the world, whether you want them to or not. They're claiming this is the Jewish perspective. This is what Jews need. Like, what do you want to encourage? What do you want to be a part of? What do you want to raise differently? But if you're not going to do it, no one else is going to do it for you. So really, how do you make sure that you're going to find those spaces and keep that, keep that impact, that kind of ripple, that ripple effect going outward? I love those statistics. So this was a specific question I asked a lot of my students in the research, and I heard a few different answers. One is they immediately took it to their families because once they um, became, I, you know, really became motivated and loved this kind of deep discussion about ideas. They wanted to speak to their adult children or their spouses or relatives. Many of them talked about, uh, one woman said, like, I have a non-Jewish partner at work, but I called her and I said, could we have a chavruta about this question? I really want to talk to you about that. And, <laughs> and, uh, and my physician, like she wanted to engage in like a chavruta conversation with some of her patients about things. So they took it to the professional world. But then um, the other two things I saw is most of my my students now study in two or three other places or other times in the week. So they took you know, like more, it wasn't like this was my one slot, more was more. And many of them now have taken on leadership positions in other Jewish organizations and their synagogues and have become teachers in their community. They feel confident to do that. So those are all outcomes where that the learning itself is beyond just personal meaning making. So I mean, it's particularly interesting to think about um, Jew, adult Jewish learners becoming um, well, evangelizing, to borrow a term, evangelizing for, uh, for Jewish learning, um, yeah. particularly when, it, you know, if they experience learning as a kind of, um, a, 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 as something that provides um, a, a seriousness, um, a spiritual seriousness, intellectual seriousness, um, and a kind of authenticity that may not be present in lots of other instrumental relationships in, in, the, in all of our lives. Um, that you know, we go through our lives and we're interacting with people all the, kind, all, all the time, but we don't often have the kinds of slow, patient, 
serious, thoughtful interactions that can happen under the best of circumstances that can happen in, in learning settings. And that can be, um, that can be really redemptive and, and um, sometimes uh, something that people wanna share. Yeah, I was thinking, of, I think that that's also critical when people realize this is a contact sport, that the, that the deep engagement, it's not like, well, they think like, well, I was taught that Moses did this, you know, or Abraham broke the idols. And that when they realize that Jewish learning is all about different voices, different points of view, mining the text for different, and that's in some way, it's not, we're not the only ones, it's that profoundly Jewish way of learning. Um, that's energizing to people. Like, they, they love that. Would you guys, Yafa, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just want to say it's interesting because for, again, for Wexner, we told them that Jewish learning is fundamental to their leadership. Like that's a premise of take. So it's it, what's interesting is like it works, you know. I don't, we, we you want and 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 I think what's and it definitely does spill over for sure into home life and to their professional lives into their into their volunteer lives. But I think what's interesting is um, it's the under coming to understand deeply that like actually learning about Moses and the breaking of the tablets is fundamental to me as a leader, not just as a Jew. And that's, I think, an interesting, and when we, you know, sort of, and, and the goal of the pluralism curriculum being that learning how to surface difference and speak across difference or build through difference actually is fundamental to my leadership. So that's an interesting um, shift, I think, but like, okay, it's great to learn things and be a intellectual, and, and that's my Jewish hat, but actually understanding the connection between my Jewish hat and my leadership hat is really part of our part of our findings. Nice, nice. Um, I do wanna make, um, th there was a question about whether a recording will be made available. Yes, yes, <laughs> there will be, uh, the, it, we are recording and it will be made available um, afterwards. And the, the specific papers that we have been referring to all along um, will be in, will be published, um, well, three out of four will be published in one book, um, which is coming out of the Portraits of Adult Jewish Learning Project. Um, and, uh, and that'll be in the spring. And then the other uh, paper, Diane's paper, is actually in a different volume that's specifically focused on um, Israel education that's being edited um, by, uh, by our colleagues, Sivan Zakai and Matt Reingold. I got that right, Diane? Did I get that right? Yeah, okay. So it's just uh, on the technical side. I wanna ask a, a question about something that's come up a little bit, but I wanna kind of bring it to the fore and that's about comfort and discomfort. Um, so sometimes educators approach their work by thinking, you know, my job is to make people who are uncomfortable their backgrounds or whatever, more comfortable in this setting, right? I need to smooth out the path. And then in other settings or other times or other educators think about my job is to be disruptive. My job is to challenge. My job is to provoke a certain kind of discomfort with, on the theory that learning comes from that kind of discomfort. So I'm curious for, for each of you, whoever wants to respond, where you see the comfort, where you see the discomfort, are you in, in camp comfort or camp discomfort, or maybe there's room for both? Um, no, go ahead, Start, you, please. Sorry, you go. Um, this idea of productive discomfort, of discomfort that actually moves you forward has been a huge part of Adelaide's model, really, I think, as long as we've existed and we were able to study in more depth um, during this project. The, the question is that, product, that that productive piece is essential because for social justice issues, if you are looking at like injustice in the world and what we are all complicit in and what we need to fight against, like honestly, I don't use the phrase you're doing it wrong very often, but if you're comfortable while you're doing that, you're doing it wrong. Like it should be deeply uncomfortable to face those issues, but that often just pushes people into guilt and into a place of overwhelm and in a place that isn't productive at all. And our goal is to keep people in this work over time and actually have their Jewish life and Jewish community support them in that, help them actually stay with those tools and be able to stay in that work and then to bring that back to their Jewish communities. The idea is for it also to kind of move in that circle in that way. And so one of the things that's felt really clear to us is that if we're not creating a relatively safe space to begin with, the discomfort can't, the discomfort, making the discomfort productive doesn't all, that that's a, it's a crucial element to making that happen. That creating enough trust between each other in the group, between them and us, 
um, to be able to say, I am going to be willing to radically reconsider assumptions that I have made throughout my life, things that I have come to understand about the world or about who I am or about Jewish life or what justice can look like, that if I'm going to be willing to do that, to say, I have to actually trust the other people that I'm in that room with enough to when they say something that destabilizes me to actually listen and to stay with it and to maybe share, hey, that's really making me feel really upset right now. And can we talk through that? Can we work through that together? And so that that question of like kind of, I think there's often a distinction between like a safe space and a brave space. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that question of can it be both has been a really important one for us. Can it be safe enough to be brave? Safe enough to be in a state of discomfort almost all the time because you feel like kind of not, I don't know, comfortable might not be the right word, but I think secure enough and trusting enough. That trust piece is, I think, the one that's really essential. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What are the thoughts on that, on the question of comfort and discomfort? One of the things, one of the things that um, is distinctive about Rachel's teaching is that after the hour of intense introduction of inherently uncomfortable issues or different perspectives or um, uh, conversations that people may not have been part of before, then she has a, uh, an additional hour that she makes available that anyone who wants to stay on the Zoom can be in conversation. And that uh, more intimate space, that opportunity to come together and just talk is, a dis is something that uh, one of the people who had studied with her at Pardes in Jerusalem said, she always had to leave to get onto something else or to catch her bus or to get your train. Here she says, I'm here as long as you want. And everyone relaxes and gets into a much more flowing reflective conversation. So there's the combination of the tension and the relaxation, the, uh, the pushing and the holding that then leads to a kind of breathing room that um, I think really enhances and, and supports people being able to move through and think again, and then they come back the next time. And her first question in the next session is, is there something you've thought about since then that you would like to revisit? Or is there something that's been on your mind? And that's very helpful to find out what people have been carrying all week. So it's interesting to think about the use of different kinds of pedagogic modalities. I mean, she's still a teacher in that free flowing um, environment that she has also created, right? That's, the, that's it's not random. Um, uh, and the, the, the use of those differences to accommodate different kinds of emotional experiences. Yeah. Somebody else wanted to jump in. Mm. Yeah. I'll just share that. The, the productive discomfort that Sarah mentioned was also fundamental to what we were trying to do. We called it constructive conflict, constructive controversy, you know, what does it mean to create that, to surface those differences? But one question that we had was, we had originally planned to do this curriculum actually at the beginning of their journey together, of their two year journey as a cohort. And we were one, and in the end, because of COVID, we didn't have three new classes to, to experiment on. And so we, uh, so we went with the three cohorts who were going into their second year. And we, we were, it's a question for us actually, whether or not we would wanna surface this discomfort right away in their formation as a group, or now that they already had built a trust and they had a year of trust together, what does it mean to surface it now? So I think we, we ended up doing it then because of circumstance. And I happen to think that it was a great um, learning of they could go deeper and maybe trusted each other more to surface those differences once they had that year. So it's a really interesting question about like camp discomfort or camp right. comfort, and maybe like right in the middle there, once there's some comfort, then we right. can surface the discomfort. Right. right, and as Sarah said, there's, there's the uh, bonds of trust that, that uh, provide enough, enough uh, of those comfortable structures to kind of hold people um, in that space. Um, one of our one of our um, participants is, has asked a question about um, whether you've seen kind of generational shifts, um, older learners and and younger. Still, we're still, still talking about adults, but older and younger. Um, are there are there trends? Um, you know, there are lots of people who will answer confidently about 
Gen Z is this and millennials are that. But I, I'm curious from your perspectives, uh, whether you have seen trends. I'd like to make a pitch for the need for research about adult Jewish learning. Uh -huh. We don't know how to answer this question. We have no database, net national or international database. We don't know who's showing up. We don't know the characteristics. We don't know the differences. And therefore it's really hard to generalize from any of these individual studies or even from our own immediate communities where a particular teacher may attract a cross section of learners uh, age-wise because of that, the charisma of that teacher. But that doesn't necessarily speak to learning in another community where uh, it's the gray haired phenomenon. It's, I think it's, a, it's a, a question we need answered and we aren't there yet. We need to work on that. Strong pitch, strong pitch from the, from the researchers. <laughs> I've been this drum for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As well as, um, in addition to needing more research in general, um, we also desperately need longitudinal um, kinds of, of work. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit beyond the capacity of, of any of, of, of us in this particular framework where we're really trying to just more or less get a snapshot of, um, at, at a particular moment in time. Um, but what we really would love to know is, so what are the trajectories? Um, you know, Jane, you have a little bit better perspective because you're with these folks for, for, um, for a longer time, but that's another kind of, of research we would love to have. Um, Okay, so that was one of the things I wanted to uh, pull up from the um, from these wonderful questions. Um, there's uh, okay, so I'm to figure out if I can frame this in a way that's going to work for for people. But um, let's um, keeping an eye on the clock. I think I, I, I'll need to um, play it safe. Um, we only have a few minutes left, um, so why don't I turn to a final question, um, which is uh, what, what really surprised you when you uh, took the time uh, to look closely at the, at, at the particular setting and the particular learning opportunity and, and develop your, your portrait? What did you see that you, that you didn't expect to see? Um, Yafa, why don't we start with you? Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I think for us, one of the one of the great surprises or learnings was that actually the level, the heat is so turned up on sitting with someone that I disagree with that I, I experience it as an existential threat. And while I completely agree with Diane, of course, that we don't have enough information, I was surprised by that after, you know, I've worked in primarily pluralistic spaces, um, the feeling in <laughs> fall uh, um, you know, 2020 was one of actually sitting with someone that I disagree with who might hold views that are so different from my own is not just uncomfortable. It, there's something in it that is an existential threat and that actually, first of all, I feel threatened by you at an existential level, but by sitting with you, I'm somehow giving a hechsher, giving a stamp of approval to your existence. And that gets in the way of me even sitting with you. Like just by being mm -hmm. in the room, that was quite a surprise to us, the level of threat that is the, and fear that is experienced by the- It's so, by it's by so by. interesting. It's like, um, it's like there's, a, there's a kind of fragility that the encounter will be, will fracture um, not, not, I, I don't think what, if I'm understanding correctly, it's not that I think you're going to change my mind, but, but being with sitting with you, if I really think that you are outside the bounds in some way, that that's really threatening to my integrity, to my moral integrity. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and I think I'm so glad you use the word bounds because I forgot to use the language of one of the things we talked about was the red lines conversation. Like when I sit with you, I cross over my own values of crossing this red line and yeah. credence, and that speaks to my integrity. Yeah, yeah. Jane, I'm still kind of like freaked out by what Yafa just said because it drew up a lot of emotion for me. Um, um, I think that I want to give credit to Diane as the 
shepherd visionary, the person who kind of moved, moved me along and taking a dissertation and turning it into a portrait. And I think what surprised me most is how, while I was writing about the developmental course of my students, I really tapped into my own personal life journey and how all of these different things that came together. I started by saying I was a teacher and a reflective practitioner about the becoming of a researcher and the becoming of a particular kind of teacher really opened up for me very much uh, my own uh, growth and change and put it in a narrative form that surprised me. So very grateful for that. So wonderful. Thanks. Sarah, what surprised you? So this was one of the wonderful things of getting to work with um, with Dr. Abby Ehrman on this is, you know, she, I, I am so inside our program. I've been working over 12 years. I did it myself. And for her to look at our survey data, do, participate in the interviews and bring her understanding of the outside research. One of the things she named for us that I think we felt intuitively, but really had not spent time digging into was the question of identity alignment and identity coherence and how important that is for our participants. That part of what they are seeking when they come to us is an ability to say, the person that I am in Jewish spaces, I want that to be the person that I am in my justice spaces. And I want those spaces to overlap sometimes. And I wanna be able to talk about that with my family and with my friends and to feel like actually that it, if anything, the discomfort can then lead to a different level of comfort in the world of saying, this is who I am and this is how I show up. And understanding how important that was and how beautiful it is to be a part of that process for them of helping them find this kind of sense of internal coherence um, was just a wonderful thing to see show up throughout that data and come to better understand ourselves. Yeah, wow, 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 wow. I mean, it's a high bar to find that, um, that shlemut, that internal coherence. Um, but if we conceptualize that as one of the desirable outcomes of a program like this, that's, that's really, really powerful. Diane. When Rahel wanted to bring us into the intimate uh, Israeli discourse, she actually created an intimacy with us as learners. I was in that case, her learner. And she brought us into her world and she did it physically by bringing us into her own study. We saw her family photos behind. And then last March, this is post book group, but it's, it's about how images stay with you. She had just started a Zoom session and we could hear her husband, Yossi, telling her to turn off the Zoom and get into the safe room because the rocket attacks had begun. To come into such close, intimate conversation with an Israeli at that moment, I choke up now in that memory. I, I carry that memory. And I think that that intimacy with an Israeli who in some ways is other for those of us in the diaspora, but we are all Kalal Yisrael, we are all part of this together. That um, intimacy of the discourse was profound for me to witness and to be part of. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So we are, we are out of time. This has been a wonderful, wonderful call, uh, conversation um, with your colleagues um, who've done, who've done just tremendously creative and thoughtful work um, on uh, these various settings of adult Jewish learning. Um, there's so much to learn from you and there's much, much more to be learned and, and, and studied about this uh, about this field, and, and we hope that we'll have the opportunities to do that. Um, I want to mention that um, we the, the events coming up at the Mandel Center include another spotlight session, uh, which will be on February 1st with a focus on Daf Yomi. Um, and then we will have a learning about learning session on March 10th with Sharon Avni focusing on American Jewish Hebrew accents. Um, please, uh, please sign up for our mailing list. Please follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn. Keep an eye out for an email announcement um, in the next couple of weeks when the video recording is available. Thank you to our panelists for your contributions for this wonderful conversation. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, take care, be well.